I'd like to start by talking about the two common responses that I get from the, you know, about the quantum threat. And, and, and it amazes me how polar it is, right? I get everything from the, I think my favorite so far has been, but is it really a threat? Really? Is it really a threat? Come on. <laughs> you know, and then, you know, all the way to Western civilization ends. Life as we know it is going to end with quantum. Hello, and welcome to the Cybrary Podcast. I'm your host, Will Carlson, Senior Director of Content here at Cybrary. And I have a really, you know, such a great privilege to be joined today by Ron Lewis with uh, Patero, a quantum company. And, you know, I'll say off the top that this isn't just going to be a single time event. We have the privilege of, you know, getting to chat with Ron and Patero over a number of podcasts that we have coming up, really to lean into a topic that's particularly of interest to him um, in his career, in his education, and for cyber and cybersecurity professionals like myself as well. Um, and so without talking too much about what that is, I'll let Ron be the expert in his space and tell us a little bit about what he does, what Patero does, and what the topic of the day is going to be. Uh, Ron, take it away. Sure, absolutely. So, hey guys, I'm Ron Lewis. I am the Vice President of Customer Success and Innovation here at Patero. And what Patero is focused on is, you know, solving the question, is quantum a real threat to encryption? And what can we be doing now? And, and, and the answer is taking a hybrid approach, right? And we'll talk about a little bit about that. Um, from an innovation perspective, I'm looking for ways to integrate, you know, post-quantum resiliency in, into the enterprise and ecosystem in, in order to help customers successfully navigate that, that quantum threat. That's great. I, I guess, Ron, help me understand just briefly kind of where Patero as an organization sits in this, you know, developing industry. You know, I think a number of people have heard about quantum uh, that, that listen to the show. Um, a number of people have some preconceived notions about that. But I, I wonder specifically, we'll get into some more of that. But wh where does Patero kind of sit in, in the ecosystem that is developing to be quantum? Like what, what solutions is Patero going to be bringing to market that people might see show up? Oh, that's awesome. Fantastic question. So. Patero brings to the market a, a quantum resilient ready encryption wrapper that that fits into today's ecosystem. So it's 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 ready. It's it's it actually uh, remedi remediates the threat that quantum provides, um, and a very easy to deploy, very lightweight. I mean, designed to run on a mobile device, you know, designed to run on a microcontroller, um, and just it actually makes networks better. You, well you mean we, you mean we don't have to have one of those fancy chandelier looking computers hanging around to to take advantage of what Patero's bringing to market? <laughs> oh my gosh, yeah, those are such interesting pictures and and no, you don't. I mean, uh, we're we're playing with microcontrollers in the OT space. I mean, small enough to fit on something like a ESP32 um, but but powerful enough to scale up to one of those you know funky chandelier looking uh, computers that you see. No, that's great. So I, you know, thank you so much for telling us a little bit about your background and kind of where Patero fits into that. But I know one of the really interesting things we wanted to talk about today and kind of address for the audience is this seemingly really polar experience that people have in cybersecurity in particular when it comes to quantum, right? And I know you and I've talked about this and, and aligned to this general, general feeling of either the sky is absolutely falling. Quantum is going to end the world of cybersecurity as we know it, all the way to people that are completely apathetical, don't know or don't care about quantum at all. Um, so I, I wonder if you can help us kind of frame out what the ends of that spectrum really are. And I have a sneaking suspicion that you're going to tell us reality really isn't at either end. It's somewhere more in the middle. But what what are the edge cases here of, of quantum and kind of the way cybersecurity seems to perceive it? Man, fantastic question. So I, I like to start by talking about the two common responses that I get from the, you know, about the quantum threat. And, and, and it amazes me how polar it is, right? I get everything from the, I think my favorite so far has been, but is it really a threat? Really? Is it really a threat? Come on. <laughs> you know, and then, you know, all the way to, Western civilization ends life as we know it is going to end with quantum, you know, no more encryption, all of our data is at risk, fundamentally our critical infrastructure is flawed, you know, and, and the panic that ensues from that, right? And 
Um, and, and there seems to be very little in between, mm. right? Um, and so I, I call the, the, the second chicken little, right? The sky is falling. And I, and I love that you say that, right? Um, when my kids were little, I, I'd use their favorite stories to, to, to do lessons. And so mm-hmm. in, in this case, there's two that fit. The first is chicken little, the sky is falling. Um, and, and there are times when, you know, you feel like as a security analyst, I, I used to do pen testing, for example, and I'd find an application with a privilege escalation uh, vulnerability mm-hmm. that would let me get root level access to the to the application, to the server hosting the application. And of course, would freak out. It's like, oh my gosh, the sky is falling. I, I own this server now. You know, and you go to the the, the, <laughs> yeah, the evil, the business owner would go, yeah, that's not, a, that's not a big deal. How could that possibly not be a big deal? Oh, we do, we decommission that app. But I, I can still access the servers. No, no, no. We, we pulled the servers out of the rack. They're, they're not powered on. In fact, we, we boxed them up. They're sitting in cardboard boxes. Every, everything's fine. You know, and it's like, oh, okay. So maybe this guy isn't falling, right? Um, the, the flip side to that personality is, is Winnie the Pooh's Eeyore, right? And, and doesn't really matter anyway. Bad things are going to happen regardless. The bad hackers are always out there, you know? You know? And so those are kind of like, the, the the two philosophies, but I think the truth, you know, is really kind of sort of in the middle. And we have to take a, a fairly pragmatic approach, you know, to, to quantifying the risk. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of what I'd like to do here, right? Especially as it relates to quantum. Um, man, I'm seeing the, both personalities. I sit in a lot of meetings and I get both, you know, and it's funny. I see them in the same meeting sometimes and it's kind of let them argue and just sit back, you know, and um but I, I think the first question that we have to answer is, is the threat real? And, and the corollary questions to that, um, if it's real, what type of risk does it pose? And, and to what degree of gravity, right? How, how real is the threat? How imminent is the threat? Mm-hmm. You know, and then and, and I, I talk to folks and they go, how, how long do I have to prepare? It's almost like, you know, when the doctor tells you you've got a serious medical condition, it's like how, how, or, or the check engine light on your car comes on and you go, how, how long do I have to get this fixed? <laughs> you yeah, know, hundred percent. What's my event horizon here? Right. So, um, and, and I think, you know, when we, when we talk about this, we have to understand that there are some fundamental challenges, you know, that, that, that quantum physicist and quantum, uh, uh, mechanics, the quantum mechanics of it all, uh, are, 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 you know, are, are facing, right? And so I, I generally tend to simplify that down into, into three phases, three, three fundamental problems. Um, and again, drawing, drawing on mental pictures, think of um, a, a bunch of kindergartners pumped full of sugar and caffeine. So when we, we talk about um, quantum computers and qubits and, and how qubits function, they're a lot like a bunch of kindergartners pumped full of, you know, caffeine and sugar. And so they bounce around a lot. Um, and so in order to do meaningful computation with qubits, there, there's three fundamental challenges. And the first one is um, what I call coherence, uh, or I'm sorry, cohesion. And cohesion is the ability to string together qubits in order to do some, some sort of meaningful computation with them. Okay. That's hurting the cats, as it were, right? It's it's hurting cats, right? We we have to have those qubits sticking together, and, and you know, computationally, in order to have any kind of real computational uh, ability. Going back to you know the theoretical science of computability, right? And, and the problem is, is that hey, it's like kindergartners full of pump full of sugar and caffeine. They just don't stay in one place, right? You can't get them to stick together, and that that's the cohesion problem. Um, the next problem is is um, you know, much like cotton candy, right? Uh, qubits dissolve, you know, from a quantum behavior perspective, once they're observed, they just stop changing state, but they de- decay very quickly. Um, and and that's a significant problem because while you finally got them to stick together, they're decaying. And by the time you do your computation, I mean, half of them are gone, right? I'm oversimplifying. And, and so if, if there's a a quantum physicist listening to this, give me some, you know, give me a little bit of grace. There. <laughs> um, 
And, and then, of course, the, the last thing is is qubits are in motion; they vibrate, and there is a significant amount of noise. And so, the three problems that that affect you know the the, the computation capability of quantum machines is cohesion, decay, and noise. So, knowing that. I mean, that significantly affects the computational complexity or capability of a quantum machine. And so then we have to apply that to, you know, what, what are the, the fundamental mechanisms used to defeat encryption and how real is that, right? And so then we go back to, and that, that necess- necess- necessitates a discussion about Shor's algorithm and, and Grover's algorithm. Although I can't ever say Grover's, Grover's algorithm without thinking, waiter, there's a fly in my soup in Sesame Street, right? So, yeah, for sure. Um, but as we talk about computational complexity, um, man, things are changing so rapidly. So we're talking about the event horizon, right? And so from a coherence, cohesion perspective, as of September of this year, University uh, in, in New South Wales uh, was able to get a coherence of qubits of two milliseconds. That's a hundred times longer than previously. Wow. So we're, we're getting close to solving the uh, cohesion problem. The other, the other aspect of defeating encryption is entanglement. You, you have to have a significant number of qubits entangled. And as of August of this year, we hit a record. And that's 14 qubits entangled. You know, and go, going back to the cohesion decay and noise problem, you, you see that we're rapidly approaching solutions for all three of those based on current progress. And so I wonder if, as we're talking about that event horizon, are we still living in a world where we're, uh, you know, forecasting when we think some of these things will hit? Or have we really began already, you know, speaking to that that dichotomy of the spectrum here. I think some people are quick to dismiss it and say, oh, this is all theoretical physics. It hasn't really hit the ground. This is like a climate model. There's not wide agreement on when this is really going to happen. It's all speculation. All the way to people that think that, no, no, it really is already here. It's going to be next week. You better be prepared. And if you're not, you're going to be behind the time. So uh, again, between those two uh, from where you sit today, wh- where is the reality between those two extremes? Okay, that's a fantastic question. And so I, I hear all kinds of answers to that, right? And so I'd like to give you a pragmatic answer. And so I'll tell you what I'm hearing first. I, I, I hear three numbers, five years, 10 years, 15 years, right? It's like, we're, we're, we're five years away from this being a real problem, okay? Um, but it doesn't, really take a lot of mathematical savvy to take our progress and put it on a, on a charted on a timeline. And then specifically around, you know, growing out the number of qubits in the machine. Right. And then, and then looking again from the context of those three problems. Um, And so I would tell you that pragmatically, we're probably one to two years away from this being a, a real threat. Right. And, And I think it's interesting. Um, there's there's the uh, security analysts, and you'll see a lot of articles about this. The security analysts that kind of want to play it safe, they they don't want to dismiss the threat of of quantum compute, and but but they don't want to, you know, beholden themselves to addressing the quantum threat. And so you'll see a lot a lot of articles around steal now, decrypt later, or you'll you'll see articles that'll say harvest now. Think, think the NSA calls it harvest now, right? Um, and that's like, well, you know, adversaries are, are stealing our data that's encrypted and we're worried about. And, and I think that a lot of the, what that speaks to is the concerns about, from a critical infrastructure perspective, mm-hmm. um, all of our classified data and the impact of quantum on the classified data. But it's a lot easier to go, well, they'll steal our data now. And then you have to ask yourself, What's the value of the data that's being stolen? What's the impact on my business? But it's kind of like a playing it safe approach. Well, you know, we don't we want to prevent our data from being exfiltrated, even if it's encrypted, you know, to prevent the impact of a, of a, a steal now decrypt later attack. 
right? So it's kind of like putting your toe one foot in the water and kind of accepting that it's kind of a threat, but nothing that, you know, you should stop other, not prioritizing this over anything else. I do wonder, do you think this is a situation that as an industry, we've been through similar things before, and this is just the latest iteration of it, that it's easy to to, to polarize, but I, you know, I, I think if we look back about how encryption algorithms have changed over time, like even relatively recently, right? So still likely people alive that remember some early, early encryption powering, you know, major world powers across the globe. And we would probably laugh at those today. So is this a narrative that's played out re- in reality over and over and over and over in our space? And yeah. this shouldn't shock us at all? So it's funny that you say that, right? Because, I mean, okay, one of my favorite philosophers is a Spanish philosopher by the name of Satiniana. And he's the guy that said, those who don't study history or learn from history are doomed to repeat it. Um, And so I I go back to the ancient Greeks and the Romans and and the Egyptians, right? And so uh, encryption takes, you know, one of two forms, generally speaking, one which takes advantage of the the physical behaviors or attributes of the solution, kind of like today, how we're doing like, you know, quantum and and qubits and photons. The the Greeks had this really cool encryption algorithm where they use sticks and cloth and they would wrap a piece of cloth around a stick of a, of a varying width and length. And they'd write a message down. And then if the receiver didn't have the exact same size stick, then, then the then the message could not be decrypted, right? And so that was an, an early form of encryption, you know. And as the adversaries got smarter, they're like, "Oh, we we got to get you know longer sticks and wider sticks, and you know, and and you know, and and, and I, I think that's funny, right? Because today we talk about we need longer and wider keys with greater complexity, and then you've got the um, you know, you know, ob- obfuscating or obscuring the message using some sort of change to the message. And, there, and there's a bunch of different forms of that, like Caesar cipher and uh, maybe Egyptian hieroglyphs, you know, hieroglyphics, you know, and, and it's funny because you can watch on the Discovery Channel and it's like, I, I'm i missing the message. I don't know what the Egyptians were trying to say in this pyramid. Well, of course not. It's encrypted. You know, uh, we have to decrypt the message in order to understand what the Egyptians were saying. And so I, I see that kind of playing out today and we're still taking the same kind of approach. And so. You know, the, the, the stick and cloth method to me would be quantum key distribution, you know, and then the, the other would be, you know, post-quantum resiliency. And if you take a look at uh, what our government, what the U.S. government is saying, if you're, you're not in the U.S., U.S. government is saying is that um, there's so many challenges to using pure quantum, you know, like quantum key distribution that uh, a, a post-quantum resiliency is probably a better answer. And it goes back to, let's take a look at the two different, you know, I go back to Shores and Grover, you know, Shores algorithm and Grover's algorithm, um, and, and, and what's at risk, right? And what's the threat? And so um, the idea of Shores algorithm uh, is very interesting because what it allows is the ability to do very large uh, integer factorization, you know, simultaneously using the transient state nature of quantum computers, right? And symmetric keys, really symmetric encryption uh, is not really at risk of Shor's algorithm, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but asymmetric keys are, and, and you, you have to kind of stop and think about that for a minute. So with asymmetric encryption, the a uh, private key is a derived key related to a public key. And so you actually have a mathematical starting point. And so you leverage Shor's algorithm. Now, one of the things that, you know, I, I, I uh, also work at a university. And one of the things that interests me is simulating quantum behavior on analog machines. <laughs> and there's a bunch of researchers that a few years ago were able to implement Shor's algorithm on analog machines. Um, oh, wow. with, with a, a pretty interesting degree of success, you know, and so mimicking a quantum Fourier transforms, which would allow, you know, very rapid, low power, large integer factorization, achieving the same result, right? So posing significant risk to asymmetric encryption. 
And then you have the camp that goes, well, then, gee, we should probably just switch everything to symmetric keys <laughs> because obviously they're better. They're more resilient to the quantum threat. And, and I would tell you, and, and by the way, you know, at, at risk to the analog threat that no one talks about. Um, and, and maybe that's fodder for a different podcast. But but then I have to bring up, hey, waiter, there's a fly in my soup. Gro- Grover's algorithm, right? Um, and Grover's algorithm is kind of interesting because it's not really – uh, mathematical, you know, division, factorization mechanism. It's a search mechanism. And the whole idea behind Grover's is you've got this black box search function that goes over, you know, it's needle in a haystack, right? You've got a, a whole bunch of hay and you're trying to isolate the needle. And the needle in this case is the symmetric key out of a, a whole mm-hmm. bunch of uh, symmetric keys. And uh, through a two phase, you know, two, two step process of phase inversion and, and media, uh, median inversion, uh, isolating and highlighting the, the value that you're looking for, in which case would be the appropriate symmetric key, that poses significant risk to symmetric encryption algorithms. And so both are at risk, realistically, you know, taking advantage of the transient state computing nature of, of quantum computers. Well, and not to mention symmetric key exchange is such a such a wonderful and fun process for all that have to be engaged in it, right? That's what we really want to fall back to is uh, <laughs> having to trade all these keys back and forth between each other. To that's a that's a non solution, right? I mean, yeah. we even if that wasn't the case, like there, there's it would be really hard for the world to step back into something like that. So that that's a that seems like a really funny retort um, to me. <laughs> totally independent of the other things being at risk, I I wonder to. You you mentioned this um, really interesting to me that how we're using analog computers to to kind of form a simulacrum of what a quantum would do is that a, a case where you know I may be wrong here but but that primary research and what we're learning there we're finding ways to apply in maybe really inventful and un you know untold ways that will really just accelerate the impact of something like quantum. So yes, it may not be pure quantum, but if we can learn something in that primary vein of research and apply it with what we have today, then all of a sudden it becomes a more prescient, a more pressing threat near term. Yeah. And that goes back to the theory of, of computability, of theoretical computer science, right? And so quantum computers solve problems, you know, computational complexity is measured as bounded error quantum polynomial time versus analog computers, which is bounded error polynomial time. <laughs> so the, the, what's missing is the quantum, right? And that's a transient state, simultaneous, you know, multivariable uh, equation, you know, resolution. So there's that. So as, as we talk through, I mean, so we should probably, I mentioned, I mentioned two fundamentally divergent approaches. One is quantum key distribution. Mm -hmm. And and I draw, I I draw attention back to the Greeks with the stick and cloth, right? Um, Can you imagine, you know, postulating for a minute, uh, the Greeks, when the Greek general came up with the idea of stick and cloth, we're going to take a stick, we're going to wrap it in cloth, we're going to write a message on it. Um, From an infrastructure perspective, they were just like, hiding the message, you know, previous to this, they're, they're doing some sort of different verbal cipher, and so now the, the Greek army has to change their whole infrastructure. It's like everybody pass out the sticks and the, 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 the different keys, right? Because those sticks are keys. And everybody pass out the cloth. And uh, it's, it's a major lift, right? And so one of the drawbacks to the quantum key distribution solution um, is the fact that it it takes rewickering the infrastructure. So um, quantum, I, I guess I should probably stop there for a second and explain how quantum key distribution works. Mm-hmm, please. Right? And, and let's let's go back to what is the relationship between asymmetric and symmetric keys because they're often used together. So in the typical, let's take web traffic, for example. In the tri- typical use case, what you're actually doing is the, the asymmetric encryption is used to ensure the confidentiality of the key exchange mm-hmm. of a symmetric key, right? And so... It's like Bob and Alice, <laughs> you know, there's like, we, we can't have a, a, a crypto cryptography discussion <laughs> without bringing up Bob and Alice. So Bob and Alice want to talk to each other and Eve wants to intercept, <laughs> right? And so Bob and Alice exchange a, a, a key pair, 
you know, they, they signed the, you know, the, the key exchange with the private key and the public key. So we're, we're you know, authenticating or verif- verifying the identity of the transmitter, protecting the key and making sure that only the recipient can decode. Right. And that's kind of how that works. And QKD um, is very much related to that. Right. So it's it's a it's a confident it's, it's designed for confidentiality only. And, and the way that it works is, is it uses um, a, a polarization of photons. And so you've got, you know, photon being a light pole. So qubit is represented as a a uh, essentially a a photon or, or light particle that's bouncing randomly around a, a, a you know, a quantum, a, a fiber, uh, and then polarizing that, uh, p- applying a, a polarization filter that uh, filters out specific random photons. And then on both sides, the, the filter has to match, right? And so that's, that's kind of, kind of how QKD works at, at a very elementary manner. Um, but what that what that means is you have to implement uh, the the photon polarization, and that's a completely different type of of equipment. And so you have to have specialized equipment. And the the other drawback to that is, you know, quantum behavior is an amazing thing. You think back to the Schrodinger's cat, the Schrodinger's cat experiment. Obviously, there's a scientist that didn't like cats, right? <laughs> I won't go too far into that, right? But I was doing I was doing a, a talk on quantum, and and you know one of the participants raised their hands, and and I said, yeah. She goes, you clearly don't like cats. I, well, I have nothing against cats. They, you know, but but Schrodinger obviously did, right? Um, and you go back to that thought experiment and the behavior of once a once a qubit is observed, it's in its final state, and so when an eavesdropper intercepts that photon um it's a it's it's a self-inflicted denial of service mm-hmm. and so there's a significant deficiency to qkd where if uh and this is according to the nsa you can go out and look at the nsa page on qkd and they go these are some of the challenges with qkd i think the biggest challenge that i see with qkd other than cost and needing specialized equipment is the fact that an adversary can completely disrupt your message transfer by simply eavesdropping, it becomes a self-inflicted denial of service. Uh, an, an eavesdropper would have to actually drop a photon on the wire and hope they got the, the polarization filter correct in order to actually transmit that photon back to the receiver. So, um, kind of kind of interesting there. So, yeah, and so so maybe a way to understand and correct me here if I'm wrong, but that, that polarization, just so everybody can maybe picture that more, like um, I, I'm sure this is orders of magnitude less complicated. But I have a pair of polarizing sunglasses, right? Which you, you many of the audience probably has. You may or may not realize that you have them until you're in your vehicle and you turn your head just right, and the display in your car goes completely black. You can't see anything on it anymore. It's because your sunglasses are polarizing one way and the display in your car or your TV is polarizing another way. And when you line up the polarization, you just black everything out. There's no more photons of light getting through those polarizing filters. So is that a fair analogy about how this works? Like if, if to your point, if the polarization is not aligned on either end, then there's no observable anything because we're not configured to see the thing we're looking to observe. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I like that, uh, you know, as I, as I look at you through, uh, blue light filtering <laughs> glasses. So, and then there's another kind of interesting challenge, right? It's like, how do you know QKD is secure? How, how do you know that the implementation of the QKD is secure? Because it's happening at a quantum level. And so one of the, the challenges that the NSA talks about is securing and validating the particular quantum key distribution method is sound, right? Um, that's, how, how do you do that? That's, that's a challenge. Yeah. How do you, how do you effectively pen test your, your QKD? Um, <laughs> it seems like from what you're saying, what the NSA is reporting is there's not really a, a, a sound way to do that. Yep. And, and so I go back to, you know, fairy tales, right? So Goldilocks and the three bears, um, the lift for implementing QKD oftentimes is kind of like Papa bear's bed. It's just too big. <laughs> it's a little heavy, you know, hard to implement, you know, and, and uh, so I guess that kind of takes us to the other mainstream approach, which is that whole idea. And, and you'll see it 
called different things and it can be a little confusing, right? There's just way too many letters. You'll hear PQC, which is post-quantum cryptography. You'll hear PQE, post-quantum encryption, or you'll, you'll hear um, PQR or QR, which is post-quantum resiliency. Um, and all of those are, are kind of, so PQC and PQ, PQE, boy, that's hard to say right after lunch, <laughs> um, uses essentially classic encryption methods, you know, adapted to provide a greater degree of resiliency. So this brings us back to the fundamental approach. There's two ways that you can approach that. One is key size. And then, of course, the other is algorithm. And so you can have a, a more complex algorithm where you can have bigger and longer keys. Uh-huh. So, and I go back to the Greeks. I, I love the I, I love the visual picture of the Greeks taking a stick and wrapping it with cloth, right? And it's like, General, we need a bigger stick. And you see two guys carrying a stick, you know, and... and <laughs> you know, <laughs> oh, that's an interesting... Yeah. Right, your, your message length had to be really short or your stick had to be really big around or really long, right? So we're, we're encrypting small messages at that point with our stick and, and our, our cloth. <laughs> and, you know, and, and so I go back to Santayana that says, hey, those who fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it, you know? And, and, I, and I go back to the malware example, you know, and... You know, there seems to be a symbiotic relationship between malware creators and antivirus companies, right? It's like there's this constant race of having to update your antivirus. Can you imagine if we had to update our infrastructure or roll out, you know, in order to, hey, quantum computers just got faster. (sighs) Bring in the bigger stick. You know, we need a longer key or something along those lines. I mean, so you kind of want to avoid that race condition. Um, and so that whole, how do you balance key size and algorithm complexity? And so what are some of the things that we have to worry about when you start looking at the typical approach? Um, okay. So there, there are several things to keep in mind here. So a lot of these are block ciphers. Uh-huh. And so you stop and think about a, the, the purpose of the block cipher is to break up the message into reasonable chunks that you can then pad so that, so that the adversary doesn't really know the full length of the message that they're trying to decode. You're introducing noise. Absolutely. But then you start thinking about the pipe and the, and the overhead. And so as you start bringing out these longer keys or more complex algorithms, some of the things that you have to think about is, well, from an overhead perspective, what does that do to my network? And if you happen to be a, a, you know, a, a cloud adopter, where you're paying for egress traffic, you know, what does that do to your cloud costs? And so those are some of the things to think about. Uh, the other thing is you start talking about key complexity. There's a whole bunch of things to think about there too, you know, so it becomes an, an order of magnitude less performant. And so what is the, the um, decoding time or the, the, um, um, <laughs> You know, to, to de- I'm sorry, decrypt was the word I was thinking, trying to think of, right? So how long does it take to decrypt the message that you're sending? Mm-hmm. Um, and what is the impact on the end user? Uh, and then, of course, so the last thing to think about is storage space. You know, from an overhead perspective, again, looking at that block size, you're starting to uh, extend out your, your block size and you're taking up, you know, significantly greater amount of storage, right? So, um so there we go, cost, right? Storage, additional bandwidth, computational complexity. Oh yeah, that's the one thing I forgot to mention. As you start increasing, you know, the complexity of the algorithm and the length of the key, what about your power costs? Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, power becomes an issue, right? And so there's a, and the, I guess the last hidden cost is in user experience. If it takes two to three times longer to decrypt the data and present it in a browser, how happy is the end user going to be? So, yeah, you know that's really interesting. I, I'm definitely old enough to remember, and it's not been that long ago, admittedly, but I'm definitely old enough to remember when. What do you mean we're encrypting the entire web? Computers <laughs> will never hold up. What's that going to do to our speeds of viewing our web page? And like, it's it's totally a normal thing now. But even even with that being the case, and our computational power across end user desktops and Raspberry Pis and etc. being what they are. 
I, I've still just heard something the other day about, well, you know, which SHA algorithm you want to use, you really should depend on the computational power and the bandwidth of the application, which is, I'm sure, largely true, but I would probably argue at this point, largely trivial given everything that we have today. But when you scale that probably at least exponentially um, for the discussion that you're having now, like some of those costs become really real, right? So as you're reading in a lot more blocks for a lot bigger messages, a lot bigger chunks at a time, like where are you even writing that to to assemble the entire message? Like, are we trying to write this to memory? Do we have enough memory to hold it? Are we trying to write it to disk, which just makes performance that much worse and is now storage? What happens if in the decryption, something breaks and we lose a piece of the message? And some really interesting costs inherent in all of that as the, you know, the proverbial stick and cloth get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and more complicated. Yeah. And then, and then the other thing to keep in mind is, you know, we talk about the whole point is quantum resiliency, right? And uh, I, I've seen a lot of solutions in the market today that, that are addressing the quantum threat with classic encryption methods that lack resiliency. So if you, drop a packet, if the network becomes unreliable, your, your ability to, to decode the message or decrypt the message suddenly goes away. Um, and so you kind of have to look at what is the implications of your network tolerance as well, right? And so I think the answer to, you know, the, the questions that I'm often asked is, you know, it, there has to be a hybrid approach. Uh, you know, there, there has to be some resiliency, you know, leveraging the current paradigm of asymmetric and, and symmetric encryption, you know, to protect the confidentiality of the key, as well as to verify the authenticity of both the sender and receiver is incredibly important, you know, and having a solution that's, you know, somewhat network tolerant, because let's, let's face it, not all networks are great. <sighs> um, Especially if you're using one of these, right? And how many times have you been in your car trying to talk to someone? And, you know, my wife is always like, hello? Hello, are you there? Hello? <laughs> you know, yes, I'm still here. Can hello? you hear me now? Yes, yes, I can. You know, and so, yeah, not, not everybody has a fantastic uh, cell phone provider. Um, you know, so you kind of have to keep these things in mind. And I, I think that, you know, looking at uh, the different ways of, of addressing the quantum threat, uh, and then having something that we can deploy today. I mean, I look at the the NIST candidates and, and there's licensing issues. Um, there's production quality. You know, is it ready for prime time? That's, that, that's the way I put it, right? It's like I ask my students, have you looked at this? Yes. Is it ready for prime time? You know, and it's funny because you know, a, a younger person will look at me and goes, what does prime time mean? <laughs> 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 yeah, back when you couldn't just binge whatever you wanted to on the streaming service of your choice. Yeah, for sure. Prime time, you know, six to eight. <laughs> when everybody's watching TV and the commercials are the most expensive. That's right. What's a commercial? <laughs> you know? <laughs> oh my gosh. So, but anyway. And so it's, it's, I, I guess the threat of quantum, yes, it's real. Should we be paying attention? Absolutely. There should be significant awareness, right? I, I mean... Um, how, how long realistically, I mean, looking at the trajectory and, and trying to calculate the event horizon, I think a pragmatic approach would, would say that we have a year to two years. So what that means is we should start looking at what are the implications on our, our business posture, security posture, if, if our data was to be compromised, if, if encryption solutions and um, what is the, the most sensitive data? You know, and, and, and what should we be protecting, you know, from a, you know, looking at it, you know, from a prior prioritization perspective, what do we need to secure first? Um, what, what will our infrastructure support? You know, what, what, you know, what, what is our latency tolerance? What is our overhead, you know, from a bandwidth perspective and start looking at what are the attributes of success so that, you know, as the NIST starts you know, putting out solutions and as vendors are bringing things to market, a business enterprise, a, a, a CSO and a CTO and a, a COO can put their, their, you know, minds together, do this mind map and go, well, this is what we can afford. You know, this is, this is what, you know, the business can tolerate. This is a latency that the end user will accept um, and, and start using that as selection criteria um, as, as we're looking across the, the market space of all of the post-quantum encryption 
solutions. I do think it's interesting too, even in the the kind of the the order of magnitude years that you gave the five, ten, and the fifteen. Like even if, if a business were to sit down and look at their data security posture, like five years is well within the range of you have to retain records um, of the most sensitive of data that that we have for people, uh, just as individuals, not counting intellectual property, government secrets, trade secrets, uh, national security items that don't necessarily have the same kind of retention structure. But even if we're looking narrowly at the retention structure, which, you know, kind of the rule of thumb is always it's seven years, it's seven years, five years is within that window. So if that's the event horizon, if, if, if you, we speculate that this is going to hit even within five years, do you think it's fair for organizations that have to retain sensitive data in any capacity past that seven year window? I would say it makes good sense that they need to be considering and looking into quantum and its impacts now. Yeah, ab- absolutely. And, and I would go back to what is the implications on the business if the data was to be exfiltrated? Um, and then what are the steps that, that they can take to start, you know, remediating the threat? Um, defense in depth, you know, defense in depth still applies, right? <laughs> so, um, and, and, you know, what, what are the supplemental controls that can be put in place to help protect that, that, the sensitive data or the prioritized data? What do you think, you know, as we're talking about threats and, and, you know, kind of the event horizon of when those threats materialize, um, you know, another argument I've heard about quantum is, oh, it's technology that's only going to be afforded to major G7 nation state actors because quantum is so expensive. This is not something that we need to really be worried about unless we feel like we're a target of those particular adversaries. Yeah, so that's a really interesting question. Because, you know, the largest quantum computers today are not owned by countries, they're owned by IBM, you know. Um, now, that, that's not to say that, I mean, the, the most advanced quantum computer, I, I think, that uh, uh, exists today is, is a Chinese quantum computer. And they have the ability to, to uh, I, I don't want to give qubit numbers, but, but they, they have, you know, the, the uh, quantum computer that's a thousand times uh, greater comp- computational complexity than some of our supercomputers um, is a little bit scary, but the fact that it's not just enemy nation states. And then we start looking at quantum as a service. I mean, and then I go back to, again, paralleling to some of the, what we see bad actors doing in, in the world today. Crypto mining, <laughs> for example, you know, in data centers is, uh. is a real problem, you know, and, and what's to prevent you know, bad actors. How do we secure quantum computers that are exposed quantum as a service? And and how do we prevent bad actors from exploiting the computational capability? You know, and then as universities get involved, universities are, are largely more focused on research, not security. And how do we keep bad actors from exploiting those capabilities to do bad things with good things? Right? I mean, there's it, it only takes one bad actor to do bad things in order to, to pose chaos you know, and, and, and implications. Yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right. And so, you know, I'm really excited that we have the opportunity to dive even deeper into a number of these topics and how they will impact this, potentially impact the cybersecurity space, I suppose is the most accurate answer here, right? Um, we can't draw a hard line in the sand and say that we've looked in the crystal ball and no, but I think we have some, you know, you and, and, and Patero and others in the space have some really good indications of how this is most likely to play out. Again, a lot of it based on history of, of you know, where we've come with cryptography so far. But I, I wonder at the end of the episode today, if, you know, assuming that we've gotten people to come along and realize that the reality for quantum and its impacts on cybersecurity specifically is not either end of the spectrum. It's not 20 years in the future, we'll begin to see the impacts of some of these things that are evolving because of quantum computing likely relatively soon. What's next for organizations? What's next for that CTO, the CSO, the CISO uh, of an organization that says, you know what, Uh, Ron, Will, I I think that's probably right. I'm sold. Now what? What do I do? Where do I go? How do I begin to understand this better and its impact potential impact to my organization and our data. Yeah. And so that if, if I could give any advice to an enterprise that realizes, so the first is, you know, raising situational awareness. Yes, this is a real threat, but pragmatically, it's not going to happen tonight. You know, it's not going to happen over the weekend. 
you know, fingers crossed, um, you know, understanding that, that, you know, and having the awareness that this is a, this is a real threat. Um, it's an emerging threat. The, the, the advice that I would give is now that you're aware, let's start looking at, because there's the market's going to be flooded with what I call snake oil. Hmm. Um, and so how do you grade a solution? And more importantly, how do you grade that it fits into your organizational mission? Um, and, and so going back to um, what are your what are your needs from a from a, a quantum protection perspective? You know, again, being very pragmatic. Um, how does the threat uh, affect you know the business enterprise of of a particular organization? Um, what is the tolerance? And then what is the infrastructure look like and what does your infrastructure support from a solution perspective, right? And then using that as your grading criteria as all of the solutions hit the market to understand and in, in what's your, you know, what's the appetite, right? What's your network look like? What's your storage look like? What is it that you can support from a business perspective? And then using that as your grading criteria as your, uh, objectively evaluating the, the the marketplace for post quantum. No, I think that's a great call out. I know for anybody that's that's watching and, and been in cybersecurity or, or IT or, or candidly many many fields for very long, um, just go to any trade show and it's always fun, right? We we like to joke that we take our buzzword bingo card with us when we go and we try to figure out what the buzzword du jour is going to be of that particular conference. And I I don't think it's too far of a stretch to to expect some of these quantum acronyms to begin popping up um, across solution providers, to, to your point. Uh, and so I think it's really, really great advice for an organization to begin being thoughtful about what a real solution would look like instead of a solution that just promises zero trust uh, at the push <laughs> of a button. You know, I think we've all seen that cycle happen and likely we'll see a very similar cycle here. Um, I, I do wonder too, so if I'm an individual, a cybersecurity professional, and and you know a little divorced from my organization's consideration of how quantum shows up, um, how do you think quantum shows up for a cybersecurity practitioner? How can they learn more? What do they need to be aware of? Is this something that they should, in your opinion, begin trying to influence from from the ground up in a grassroots capacity at their organizations? What what does our individual listener uh, to the show need to walk away from, and and kind of what action can they take uh, past this point? Yeah, fantastic question. And you know, as a guy that's done a lot of reading on quantum, yeah, particularly as it as it applies to the quantum threat, right? There's uh, a couple things, a couple takeaways that a security practitioner should probably do. Uh, um, the first thing is go study Schneer, right? So Bruce Schneer, and take a look at what he says about the quantum threat. That's probably the most interesting reading. Um, you know, go back and take a look at what, what Peter Shore wrote, I think in the seventies about, you know, the, the quantum threat, because it still holds true today. Um, I would spend, uh, some time looking, you know, at what the NIST site, the NIST has put out some really great guidance, uh, around the quantum threat and it, it's pretty comprehensive. And then the last thing that I would say is take a look at the math behind Shore's algorithm and Grover's algorithm. Uh, there, there's plenty of YouTube videos out there that that you know kind of simplifies for guys like me that that aren't math, you know that that aren't like super deep into quantum quantum math, you know that that is is very understandable. But what what it provides is the ability to quantify all of these different solutions realistically, and you know make an educated decision, informed decision about all of the products that are going to be flooding the market in the next year. No, that's great advice, Ron. I'll I'll post the challenge to you and the commitment to, to viewers of the show that we will post a number of these links and references as we have them in the show notes below from Ron. So you don't have to go searching all over the place and you make sure, um, as we all know, to get the authoritative uh, sources for many of these things and not snake oil of a different flavor. Um, Ron, Thank you so much for joining us today. I am very excited to get to have a number more conversations with you about the topic of quantum and how it impacts cybersecurity in particular. Uh, very thankful to, for, to Patero for the partnership on this podcast series. Um, I'm really looking forward to it. Everybody stay tuned. Ron and all the viewers, thank you so much for your time and attention today. More to come on quantum, more to come with Ron and with Patero very soon.